I guess. Is there a time we should start, do you think? We're ready? Good morning, everybody. Um, I just, uh, I look out at this situation in this entire weekend and I, I really am somewhat overwhelmed. Uh, so if, if I get uh, all verklempt <laughs> at various, at various times, you'll, you'll, you'll be here to put a stop to all of that and to, to put this in the proper perspective. But this is just such an honor to, to be honored in this way. And uh, we're coming up on 30 years in this community. And uh, it was actually spring of 1982, and I had my audition in this very room. And Logan Skelton and Lisa, his wife, were two of the people that were on the master class that I taught then after that. And I kind of remember it as if it were yesterday. It seems to have, have gone by so terribly quickly. And, you know, the, I had the good fortune of stepping into a situation where there are already some very good singers here, and, uh, and, uh, and then there were some that weren't so good, but, uh, but uh, a lot of the ones who were very good are the ones that uh, planned this reunion, especially Suzanne Duplantis, Berta Welchel, Robert Bullington, um, uh, Lise Vachon, and then my daughter Anne-Marie, who is fortunate enough to be living in the same area. And uh, they, it's just been a wonderful synergy of energy. And uh, there was a beautiful program last night at the Opera Guild home in which so many sang so, so well and so beautifully. Um, so anyway, this morning, uh, this is called, been labeled a master chat as opposed to a master class. This is also the space where we have our weekly master class. Uh, Ellen's in my studio and then the other studios also are in this space. And uh, usually what happens in that situation is that the kids come up and they stand right here and they sing whatever it is that they have prepared that week and then we give just a very short comment. We don't usually do what's kind of known in the trade as a working master class. There's, there are a lot of these master classes around these days and some of them are useful and some of them are not. And uh, the ones that I always find sort of least interesting are the ones where the where the uh, clinician gets up and essentially kind of tries to teach voice in 10 or 15 minutes to a person who has years of acquired habits and maybe already sings pretty well or, or maybe doesn't sing so well. And it's, uh, it's, I don't find that to be terribly productive. What I find is productive in a situation like this is to try to maybe work on one or two things that uh, can inspire the singer or if you notice some obvious things, uh, sort of just physical, mechanical things that can be corrected rather quickly, um, you, you, you address those. Um, I've seen miracles take place in this room. And as a matter of fact, this past year, there was a master class for the Metropolitan Opera Association. And one of the contestants, who is uh, a student of mine, had a kind of an aha experience and had a great breakthrough and unfortunately, it lasted about that long, you know. So uh, I thought, oh, this is going to be the beginning of something really great, you know. We're going we're gonna to go on from here. And he wasn't really able to take it with him. So the, the situation is, is um, it, it's, it's, an, it's a tricky situation. I think the most uh, important thing about it is, is that we have to create uh, something which is a little deficient in the arts these days. And that is a feeling of encouragement and community and mutual love for what we're doing. Because it's so very easy for performers to walk out on the stage and feel that the audience is their adversary. You know, and that they're going to be nothing but critical of them. And so this is our own little step to try to include everyone rather than the singer up here and, and the, the audience out there and waiting for them to sing the next wrong note. and, and uh, this kind of thing, because that goes on, and th those are demons which we all fight. Uh, um, the singers that I'm working with today, I'm going to do very different things with. The first one, David Castillo, 
Uh, why don't you come on down, David? And, and uh, I should say I have the able assistance of Jesse Reeks at the keyboard. This is not an easy thing to do to have music just thrown at you. <laughs> but the, the guy reads like a pro. Now, David is the only one of these uh, people who today who is currently my student. And everybody else is students mainly from quite a while ago. And I haven't heard them in a long time. And I'm just going to enjoy it and probably tell stories. But, <laughs> but with David, uh, we may do a little bit more of what resembles a lesson situation. Uh, he's, he's a, you'll see, he's a wonderful kid. And I'll let you introduce what you're going to do. And I'm going to be here just breathing right down your neck. <laughs> <laughs> My name is David Castillo. I just graduated um, from Loyola this, um, in December, and I studied for another semester with uh, Mr. Fronmeyer. And I'll be singing "And Farewell to the To Ye Old Rights of Man" from Benjamin Britten's "Billy Budd," his very last aria before he gets uh, hung from his on his ship. <laughs> Strike down the jammy legs, it's fate. And Captain Veer has had to strike me down. Fate, we're both in sore trouble, him and me, with great need for strength. And my trouble soon ending, so I can't help him long. <laughs> 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 so 
Well, it's obviously just a total drag to teach a student like this. And he, 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 he absolutely, I, I have to say about David that whatever I give him to do, he does it. Um, there's um, one of the things that you encounter in treating, uh, treating, <laughs> sound like a doctor. <laughs> I've been in a lot of treatment myself <laughs> lately. Um, one of the things that you find in working with, with young students is that um, very often there are huge areas of conflict in their decision to sing and in the act of singing. And um, David is one of these people that I don't think you have a lot of conflict about that. This is kind of what he's wanted to do and he decided to do it. And so there isn't that sense sometimes of ambivalence that can get in our own way. Change is difficult even when you want to. You know, we, uh, but if there's something in you that doesn't want to change, that's a real impediment to progress because uh, singing is a, a, a mind-body discipline. It depends on the fact that your concept mentally is clear and then impediments get out of the way so that your body can carry out that task. And if there are roadblocks along the way, they're just going to trip you up unless you really acknowledge what those are and, and work on them. And uh, you've done a lot of work on that. And um, I, I have to ask about the piece. Let's talk a little bit about the piece now. How many of you have ever heard this? Anybody? Yeah. Well, more than, more than I would have thought. Um, this piece happens to be um, a piece that I sang years ago in the Munich contest. It was on my repertoire. I had not known it, but I was looking for an English, English language aria that not very many other people would have. And uh, the jury asked for it, and I sang it, and it went well, and it advanced me then into the final round. It was one of the things that I did sing. I have not sung it since. I've barely heard it since. Uh, Billy Budd is an opera that is starting, though, to get done more uh, for a variety of reasons. And um, you will hear that uh, those of you who know the Melville story know that the uh, there's a very strong Christian allegory in this piece where Billy is a sort of Christ-like figure and Captain Veer, who is forced to uh, sacrifice his life, is, is a God-like figure. And so all of this, I think, read very well in what you were doing. Um, I would like to just look at a little bit of it. I think, I think what could become a little bit clearer is when you go from one section of it to the next that we have more distinct... This is your first time out on this piece, isn't it? Yeah. He's never performed it in public. <laughs> yeah. uh, later in the summer, the part of the reason for this is later in the summer he has a, a, an uh, opportunity to audition for the role, and so he's learning as much of it ahead of time as he can. Smart boy, huh? Um, so I think maybe I'd like to just look at the beginning part of it a little bit, and. Um, one of the things that you might think about is when you go from different moods, from one mood to the next, your intensity is always kind of like this, also in your arm, of just sort of, I'm contented, don't matter now getting hanged. You know, that, that period where, where you allow yourself physically to kind of relax because you need it also vocally. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, sometimes we, we do things dramatically on the stage that are appropriate, but we also do them because they make us sing better and they help you to achieve a better, uh, if you will, vocal product as, as you sing. So uh, maybe if we could just start again. How's the balance out in the hall? Is it good? Because I'm sending, yeah, okay. I'm going to just step away a little bit. So, I, Yeah, start, start, yeah. Where do you want to start? Let's, let's start from the aria. Let's start from the aria part.
it's excellent. Be careful in this room. Your tendency is going to be want to, to look up and sight the sail someplace too high, and you break a little bit your connection with your support, and it starts to get a little bit like that. Not much, mm -hmm. but enough so that, and I'm contented. So you're not quite, if you're contented, you're contented from down here. Mm -hmm. You're not contented intellectually. Huh? You're, you're contented. Huh? Yeah. I didn't find it at all objectionable, but I did notice the difference in the way his voice sounded when he started singing the second time. I think that's what you're talking about, that, that brightness. What do you find not right about that sound? Is it not supported? Well, it, it, any time, of course, you know, when you start somebody in the middle, I'm interrupting his momentum, and he's likely to be a little bit less connected to his physicality at that moment. He's thinking, you know, I'm giving him critique, which is existing in his head, right. uh, and that takes you out of your body. So you have to make a conscious effort with your breathing to get back in, into your body. Why don't we just repeat that little spot again? And, you know, you can come back dynamically a little bit. Yeah. And I'm contented. You know, just pull it back a little bit. Huh? Let's do that again and, and get all the way down to your feet with your, with your support. That part of that, yep, that's great. Yeah, just and farewell. Oh, good, sorry. Yeah. And farewell. And I'm contented. I've seen where she's bound for. You need it maybe to rest, too. You know? We have to be clever. You're singing very forte, and the orchestra's big. You know? so, and the audience needs a little, little bit of time. I, I can't demonstrate it very well, but you do it. Huh? Um, <laughs> How about, but I've sighted a sail in, this, in the storm. And you could use a new color there, too, you know? OK. But I've sighted a sail in the storm, a far shining sail that's not made, and I'm contented. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, you don't look like it. You don't look like it. <laughs> Once more, same Please. thing, yeah. But I've sighed in a sail in the storm, a far shining sail that's not made, and I'm contented. I've seen where she's bound for. She has a land of her. And don't give yourself away quite so soon when you start the next section then. I've seen where she's bound for. Da, 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 da. Make sure you're getting all the way down. Be like a dog's. Same spot again. <laughs> but I've sighed. To, to me, your timing is just a shade off. Um, you're, but I've sighed. You're starting before your support is really working under you. Mm -hmm. huh? Give yourself time for your voice to speak. He'll wait. Huh? Mm. But I sighed in a sail in the storm, a far shining sail that's not made, and I'm haunted. Yes. I've seen where she's bound. Let's make that better. Yep. I've seen where. Sing a longer note on scene and get your legato and your breath moving on scene, and then you'll get up over the top of it without reaching for it. I've seen right on it. 
Choose, choose your vowel better. Yeah. I've seen where, seen where she's bound. Make it nice and slim. Not where, but where. <laughs> I've seen where she's bound for. Now think for a minute. She has a land of her own, where she'll anchor I'm strong, and I know, know it. There's a place in here that's dangerous, um, where you where you have uh, don't matter now because the temptation is to want to make a very big crescendo on that note, and it's not a, a, that hospitable a note for a baritone. Uh, the, it's where is the don't matter now? Where is that? Uh, yeah, it's it's a, it's an E natural, and sometimes that's a. You just have to choose your vowels very carefully at that point. So, don't matter no. And you can certainly lift as much as you as you can, but don't try to go beyond what your voice just naturally wants to give to you. You want to start it right there? Don't matter now. And then before you sing, I, I'm strong. You know, as a, a conductor friend of ours used to say, go out and have a sandwich first. Huh? <laughs> Take your time. Huh? <laughs> Well, he's a really good sport. <laughs> you know, it, this is a lot to ask at this hour of the morning, especially after being up. This is, mornings are never easy, but you know, I've got to tell you that in the business, so oftentimes when um, Logan and I have recorded, for instance, it's been nine o'clock in the morning sometimes, and, and I've had orchestral rehearsals with the Dutch Radio Orchestra and in the Opera House and everything, and boy, they start at nine o'clock, and they're union, and they're there, and they're ready, so you got to be ready. And, Generally, for a singer, that means that you have to get up early and, and hydrate well and maybe exercise a little bit so your body's kind of under it. There's an order today, and I can't remember what it is. Bert is next, and you can, uh, this is Berta, Berta Welchel Sabrio, and she was in the first class of students that I had at Loyal, and she will announce her piece. <laughs> and I also have to tell you that even though it's been 30 years, Sitting in this hall, waiting to get up here to sing, feels exactly the same. <laughs> <laughs> I can't decide if I need to throw up or I need to go to the bathroom. I'm not certain, but I'm feeling all those exact same things. And I think it's something in the chairs. <laughs> because I've been in other halls and not felt the same. But this one, I was just like, oh, I remember that feeling. <laughs> Secondly, I have to say that for those of you who have ever worked with Phil, you know that it's almost impossible to say no to him. In February, I was doing laps with him in a hospital corridor. And he said, you know, Berta, I think you should sing The Heart's Desire on the Master Jet. And there we have it. <laughs> oh, of yes, Phil. I'll be happy to. You know, he was just
just had his surgery and we were racing to keep up with him and there was no telling him no for that for sure. Well, I appreciate it. <laughs> the Heart's Desire the by John Ireland. The Heart's Desire by John Ireland. This is going to be a little bit story hour now. This is a, a, a little transition in this. And uh, you, uh, you don't know what I'm going to say quite yet, but I want to talk just a little bit about this rather striking uh, song, which actually was a, is a very famous song in England, or it was at one time. Uh, we know this because um, there are a couple of novels in which the song is sung that are written by 20th century British authors. I think there's a Dorothy Sayers novel where she says someone at a party or at some occasion sang The Heart's Desire. Uh, there may be an Agatha Christie. I mean, it just was a very known song, and it was known for quite a good reason. The poem actually predates uh, World War I, and it's about, obviously, uh, the, the loss of a love. Uh, you know, that it's, it's nice when people can go up the hill and fetch flowers or fetch plants for those whom they love, and, and this is the time of the year when they're doing that, and I hope that not only my, not, not only, let not only my search be vain, for lovers should be loved again. You know, that, that we have this, this situation where uh, so often exists in love where one person loves more intensely than the other and they don't get together. Well, uh, in between the composition of the song or the setting of it to music was World War I in England. And uh, everybody lost somebody in World War I. It was, I think, the casualty figures for the British men were somewhere around a million, maybe. Uh, I, I remember these are things that I learned in history when I was in college, and I don't quite remember the exact figures anymore. But it was huge loss of manpower, a huge number of boys who should have come back down the hill with flowers for their loved ones didn't return again. So the song took on a particular kind of resonance for, um, for British people and was justly uh, not necessarily celebrated, but it, it was resonant, had a great deal of resonance with all of the people who heard it. I find it tremendously touching today. Um, I remember at the time that I assigned you this song, 
that Berta is such a, an outgoing and, and jolly person, but um, you were addressing some things in your life that weren't quite so wonderful, and we didn't have any success having you sing happy songs. <laughs> and uh, we, as a result, I, I just said, well, let's give you songs with re rather serious things in them, and, and uh, one of them was the Adieu Notre Petite Table, I remember, of Manon, which you sang very beautifully, and this song, and some others, and it really unlocked your creativity, I felt. Did you agree with that? Yeah? I'd like you to sing it again, and I think, I think I'd like it to move a little bit faster. I, I felt the tempo was a little bit slow, maybe about da -dum, da -dum, da -dum, da -dum. Let's just see how it goes, and I'm not going to say much. Let's see. It, Robert, are you up next? Oh, come on down. Robert Bullington, who is going to sing for you now, was um, also in that first group of students and came to me as a flutist. And um, uh, the director of choral activities, uh, Larry Wyatt at that time, said, well, you know, he has a rather good voice. And I heard him sing, and I said, you know, what do you want to mess around with that flute for when you... You happen to be walking <laughs> by the room when I was auditioning for Larry. Oh, okay. Well, I was nosy, you know. <laughs> I'm still kind of nosy. Uh, uh, but um, Robert, uh, at that time, had a very easy, and still does, had a very easy high baritone voice. And I had it in mind. A friend of mine had said, well, you know, there are these trois uh, ballades de François Villon, three ballads of François Villon of Debussy that, have, uh, that are really beautiful and they're not done that much. And uh, uh, I kind of looked at them and I thought the central movement was a prayer to his, that was written to his mother, who was illiterate, and so he was uh, writing the, the prayer to her. We can kind of get into the text right. stuff uh, a little bit. And uh, writing it for her in a way that was total, totally sincere in faith, and took some of its inspirations from the cathedral windows of the, of the church. And uh, I just thought it fitted you beautifully. And I have to confess that I learned the song from him and then started singing it myself later. So, so I stole from him. But um, uh, 
he, in, in the meantime, well, we'll just do the song, and then we can talk a little bit about, you've had a lot of acquaintanceship with the song. He's actually going to perform the entire set on Wednesday, he told me, so, right. great. Uh, uh, the thing that always amazes me about uh, Debussy is that he seems just to walk out of nowhere in, in music history. There's not a voice that's really like him before or that's like him after. I mean, there are imitators and, and movie music and so forth has picked up certain gestures that he made. But in this particular mood that he's in, he, he gets very much a sort of a medieval spare sound by the use of so many open intervals. And that's very beautifully realized in the piano. And, and uh, the, the, the sentence that you keep returning to 
in this faith I will live and die is just so very moving as, as she, she goes through it. Um, you got a performance of this on Wednesday, and I don't want to mess very much with it. You know, when people get close to having to do something, I always find that I say a little bit less and a little bit less and a little bit less. What kind of room are you in for that, for this? Um, I'm going to be in a, in a private home, a pretty large living room. This yeah. is um, Dr. Scheide at Princeton. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'll be looking at an original oil of Bach. About, about like 10 rows back. Right, right. Well, what, what I'm getting at here is that, you know, uh, Robert has coached a lot of this uh, literature with Dalton Baldwin, whom he actually introduced us to, who was an uh, American pianist who spent a great deal of time playing for French singers and made a, a great deal of his, of, of his career in Europe and was justly famous and can get more colors out of the piano than you would ever dream possible. He's just a fabulous player, and even at now 85, I imagine he still plays fabulously. Yeah, there's a, there's a so, picture of somebody growing old somewhere because he isn't. Yeah, yeah, well, I envy that picture. But, <laughs> uh, but in any case, um, I would say in a room of this size, I wouldn't come down so low with my dynamic uh, because it causes you sometimes to get a little bit off of your, your breath and off of your mechanism. So why don't we do a little bit of it again, and I'm just going to kind of sit out here and look at you and see what you're doing, because I think, um, I think vocally you just need to give a little bit more, and it needs to, needs to be a little better supported. a song of great sensitivity, you have to always balance the very quiet singing with then giving the audience your voice, you know, because what they want out there, there's a visceral quality of being able to give just voice. And, you know, I know Dalton likes to keep everything kind of down. No, <laughs> he reminds me to keep singing. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> well, I'll remind you again, but I, I just thought at the very beginning, uh, can you play the intro? And I don't think I can probably sing it, but I want you to sort of watch. I take my breath over much more time than you do, and I think that might, would be a good idea. Because anytime you sort of do, Dama, do you see yeah, just, just, just allow yourself to sort of settle with your breathing and everything into the tempo that you're going to sing. This is one thing I was taught in Germany by a lead class, uh, lead class instructor, Konrad Richter, with whom I studied. Was, Learn to take your breath in the tempo that you're going to sing when you have the time, when the piano interlude gives you that much time. So let me see if I can do it. Huh? Oh, 
you did it very much that time is you need to take us through it remember Americans don't know it you know they, they don't know what you're singing about but if your intention inside is very clear then they will have the impression that they have gotten it you know at the end he sings I'm not a liar she says I'm je ne suis pas mentoresse uh, en cette fois je veux vivre et mourir and I totally got it you know uh, of course I know it you know so I'm I'm cheating but but the idea when you and they would have words but you know you don't really want them looking down at their words very much but you just have to you have to be that painter and and that person and you know all of that huh? but sometimes it just has to be a little bit bigger when we get out in front of the public um, the microphone would like very much a lot of things that you did but the hall doesn't like it necessarily quite so well because what you want to do is you want to, to build a, 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 a fire inside of yourself that's so bright that they come to you, you know, and you've got to also assume that maybe some of them are a little bit hard of hearing and maybe not terribly intelligent either <laughs> so that you have to really talk to them and tell them what you are doing. Wednesday night crowd's a little bit more on the heart of hearing. The heart of hearing. Well, then, then you're, you're going to have good, good practice. You want to sing maybe the end of the piece? It's, it's so beautiful. And, um, and, I, and I, 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 I always make the, the, the pianist play the last couple of bars. Carmen Leerstang knows this because I just like it so well. <laughs> but um, uh, la joie avoir fait moi the last part is a kind of a prayer to Mary, um, where it says the, 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 the joy, um, uh, give, me that joy. give me that joy, uh, uh, elevated, uh, elevated, elevated goddess, goddess heaven, yeah. uh, who, even though my sins have been considerable, uh, sort of paraphrase. So let's maybe, can we lead into that just a little bit? And, and again, let, let them know what you're doing. I hear that postlude that Debussy has put this sort of golden halo kind of around the whole experience of the song. And uh, it's, uh, you know, his mother, if she isn't a saint already, she's headed in that direction. She's one of, one of the saints. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing. I find that Robert has a very beautiful ev owl up in the upper part of his voice. Uh, just, just a beautiful, beautiful ev owl. Where, where is that? Uh, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, today is, uh, don't be shy about it. You know, there's nothing ugly about an open O, uh, open E. Eh. In fact, my teacher was very insistent that the colors of the, the song and the colors of the emotion were contained in the colors of the vowels that you used because that's where the emotions really were carried and conveyed. I wouldn't uh, humor me and sing it one more time and, and just really allow your voice to go. Let it go on the... On the okay. Oh, this is wonderful. <laughs> this is what I need. <laughs> <laughs> Uh... 
stunning. Baby, you sound wonderful. <laughs> really enriched my day. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Brian, it's time for you. This is Brian Stratton. Brian came just a little bit later, but uh, overlapped with some of these people here, and uh, had come with quite a few very good vocal habits already in place from, uh, is Gordon Olson still alive? No, no. About four years, who was at that time a teacher at Southeastern. And uh, so I got to kind of do some icing of the cake a little bit and change a few things. And next thing you knew, he was in the Met auditions and got to New York with, with the Met auditions and singing a very challenging repertoire. And this morning, uh, I think we worked on Sue Agnew together, didn't we? Wasn't it on your senior recital, which you gave over at Christ Church, as I recall? And Moses Hogan played the late. Okay. So anyway, um, Brian's going to sing "Zu Eignung" of Richard Strauss. This was my audition piece in this very room in 1985. <laughs> okay. Now that part I'd forgotten. <laughs> Brian has been uh, uh, sort of physically out of sorts for the last several months, and I'm so glad to hear him because whatever it was, it isn't your voice. Huh? So, so your voice is still very much there. You know, Strauss, um, this is a little bit, we'll do a little bit of story hour because there isn't a whole lot that we need to do on this. This is really a very finished, and you, you've thought about what, you're, what you want to do with this, and your intentions are clear. And uh, this is a, a song about um, pledging really singing of the gratitude that one lover has for another who has really given him a, a, a new, new way of looking at life. And it's, it's just a kind of a pledge. You know, I did all of these other things. I was a heavy drinker. I was this, I was that. And, and it's, it, but it's, it's your love that really has redeemed me. And for this, he keep, it comes back three times, have a I, I have thanks. Uh, and uh, this is one of Strauss's most popular songs for a very good reason. It has three very clear sort of verses and a very well-approached and exciting climactic top note, which you did very well. 
and which a lot of singers like to, to hang out on a little bit, which I think is perfectly permissible to do that. <laughs> and you played the two measures that everybody stumbles over really well, by the way, too. <laughs> He has a nasty little interlude in there between the, the, the last bit of it and, and the Habe Dank. Um, Strauss used to, when I was in Germany, uh, I, I learned a group of Strauss songs for the Liedklasse, and um, this was among them. Um, I had probably learned that one before, but I learned probably six or seven with Konrad Richter. And I noticed at that time in Germany, um, not from the instructor of the class, who had great respect for these songs, but from some of the other students, they would say, ach, die Amerikaner, die wollen immer Strauss singen. And you know, the Americans, they always want to sing Strauss. And they said it was such disdain and kind of uh, snottiness. And um, uh, I think th there were several reasons for that. Um, I think that one of it was that, of course, there had been a very bitter war, and, and Germany had been destroyed. And people were in a cynical frame of mind, and they did not like the overt sentimentality of some of these songs. And they are sentimental. They're also very well crafted. And you know what? It also takes a lot of technique to sing them. And a lot of German singers simply didn't sing well enough to sing a, a great deal of Strauss. There, were, there was, you know, and, and that was very evident during the time that I was there, that the, the level of, of and, and the Germans themselves would have said it, that the level of music instruction, particularly in the area of voice in the United States, was much stronger than in Germany. Um, but anyway, I think, if, judging from what I'm able to ascertain, I haven't back, been back to hear recitals in Germany, but I hear things on YouTube and I hear German singers singing Strauss all the time. So I think Strauss is, I think they've kind of gotten over that prejudice. And um, Strauss is one of those composers, rather like Britain, who uh, had a lot of natural facility at composition. And some of the people in music who had to work a little bit harder did not like him for it. They thought that he was a little bit too clever and a little bit too facile, and things came too easily to him, so it couldn't therefore be very good music. I find that less and less convincing as I get older. I, I think we can enjoy each of these composers for what they do. You know, Strauss, I think, is quoted some places saying that he could orchestrate a glass of beer, and, and he, he, he probably could have. And, uh, and there were all sorts of things. We did a, a program my wife and I did, uh, or my wife did, of Strauss's, uh, about Strauss and the relationship with his apparently very difficult wife, who would just say things to him like, she, well, they, it was time to go on their walk, and, and he said, well, I'm just finishing song. Well, she said, but you better finish it quick, because we go on a walk in 10 minutes. And that was the law. So. So uh, she, kept him, she kept him in line, more or less. Um, I'd, like to, I'd like to look at you out front as you do this a little bit. Um, I'd just like to. But there were several other pieces that we also did perform. Die Nacht. Die Nacht, right. And uh, uh, Nicht. Yeah. And they all have the, that same vocal line. I think people tend to think of Strauss as, you know, you said, yeah, no. 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 And it, it, you really have to develop a full line in the music. No, no, and, and, and he doesn't always make it easy for you because the rhythm is sometimes very tricky and you have to get in. But he loved uh, the tradition of singing in the time that Strauss composed in Germany was essentially, essentially an Italianate tradition. The teachers of singing were Italians or had been trained in Italy. And all of this current sort of more discursive, more text centered, I'm not saying that they didn't, um, uh, they didn't do that, but when I studied, for instance, with Hans Hotter in Germany, he did not allow me to inflect every word that I sang. He said, pick out one word in the phrase that corresponds with the, the musical high point of the phrase and shape your phrase toward that, and I want otherwise a very beautiful legato. And he said, now I want you to sing your piece on vowels alone. Well, you know, my German wasn't that swift at that time, and that was a, a big deal to so, uh, but I can still do it, huh? Ja, du weißt es teure Seele, das. But that gives you the line that you have to have, which is exactly correct in which time. Let's sing it again. <laughs> Oh. 
Um, yeah. it, uh, you, it's, it's beautiful. When you sing in German, though, they want you to get to the vowel right away. It can't be, ja, du weißt es, got to be, ja, du weißt es, toll sie. And, and really go, go right to the vowel. Yeah, don't, don't slide into it. Uh, that, that's the, that, that would get you accused of the thing that they don't like, the sentimentality. And there, believe me, there are a lot of Germans that sound just like that. Huh? <laughs> so, so go right to the vowel. Right on it? No discreet scoop. Oh, yeah, no, no discreet scoop. <laughs> no scoop at all. <laughs> because you're saying precious soul. Yeah, precious soul. And if it's, oh, you're just so precious. You know, it's, it's not that kind of, no. It's something you pay a lot of money for. It's precious. It's not teure, it's teure Seele. line here, Liebe mach, love makes the heart sick, have thanks. So, so uh, ja du weißt es teure Seele, dass ich fand, you, that, that I far away from you, I'm tortured. Love makes the, the heart sick and, and have thanks. Well, he's going to get around to something else, you know, but Liebe mach die Herzen krank. You could say that almost just sort of, you know, love makes the heart sick. It doesn't have to be, I'm just suggesting a different way. Uh, it's, it doesn't have to be, Liebe mach die. There's time for that later. Uh, you, 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 I wouldn't tip my hand quite so fast. That's just me, though. Uh, let's try. <laughs> When you say, you're saying a couple of different colors of donk, yeah. Liebe mach dir habe donk, and it's going a little bit back and it's changing the color of the vowel. Habe um, donk, just, just, just start it and leave it alone. And I think each one of these habe donks, I've always found them very difficult to, to sell because they just sort of come in, you know. Habe donk, you know, so. They have to have some relationship. Yeah, with you just, just, give, just give an attitude in your face that says how you're going to say it when you take your breath, and then we'll have it. Let's do the thing from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs>
Ah, what a pleasure. What a pleasure to hear this voice again. And you know, I just have to say one thing. If I sounded that good on a top note, I'd look a little happier about it when I sang it. <laughs> I, say, I say this because we often don't have the opportunity. Uh, many people will teach you. Many people will coach you. Not many people will believe in you. I have carried this with my students every day that I believe in you because someone dear to me believed in me. I tell you younger students now, listen carefully because there are many uh, prestidigitators out there and you end up in a whirlwind that you cannot get out of because you are so confused by people who don't believe in you and your talent. I stand to tell you today that Philip Frommeyer believed in me and believed deeply in what I could do. And he wouldn't allow me to just do any kind of shisha that came out. It had to be the best. So I take this moment to thank you for believing in me and allowing me to pass on the love and the knowledge and the gift of music that you have given to me. And I hope to honor you by giving it to many other students. Thank you. We're getting the A-team today. Here comes Amy Frimmer. And uh, Amy is uh, my colleague now in teaching at uh, Tulane. Helps cover for me part of the time when I wasn't feeling so good. Her husband's also been a great friend to the family. All sorts of wonderful things. Came to me for a master's degree and we had a wonderful time, didn't we? Yep. So anyway, so what do you want to sing? Uh, I've got Um Bell D. All right, let's do it. <laughs> but I think you said what we all feel, you know, that um, just, I, I have to have story time too, just for a second. Story so time's great. Down. <laughs> um, when I um, was getting ready to do my comprehensive exams, um, I was very nervous about it, and I was driving to school. I live in Destrehan, and I was driving here, and I got a phone call from a friend of mine who runs a small opera company, and he said, hey, so you want to sing a Butterfly in Three Weeks? <laughs> and I didn't care about my comprehensive exams anymore. <laughs> and, um, and it probably was the dumbest thing I've ever said yes to. Um, but when I told Phil, he said, in the way that he does, oh, Aim, I think you can do it. <laughs> and he helped me do it. So, uh, thank you. <laughs>
Well, you sing this with great emotional truth and a uh, uh, little, little bit of story hour about the, the piece in general. You know, when I was growing up, every, every soprano kind of sang Un Bel Di. They weren't so concerned now if you, if you walked in and sang Un Bel Di that you be the exact uh, Renata, Renata Tobaldi or De Los Angeles clone. That it was just a popular song that a lot of sopranos learned and they sang it. At, I mean, I can remember my mother playing it for people growing up who, who didn't have a tenth of what you have vocally, but it was just, it was just one of those arias that everybody, everybody knew. I've had it in my mind um, for years to write a short article about uh, soprano arias that are kind of of this genre. This is one, Ain't It a Pretty Night from Susanna is another one. Uh, I can think of several if I really put, but, but which have a, a universal emotional truth to them. And that is of a young person and promise negated. There's just something incredibly touching about it, about the idea that here's Chocho San, she's kept her house ready for the return of her sailor husband. And we all know that this isn't going to work out. You know, we know that it just isn't going to work out. And you know, a lot of things in life just don't work out in this way. And I think uh, if you're not affected by Butterfly and her story, that you've kind of got a heart of stone. I don't think, <laughs> I don't have a lot of hope for you. <laughs> if, you <laughs> if, if you can't get on board with Butterfly, why, you know, it's, it's kind, of, kind of too bad. I wouldn't say too much about it, except, um, um, you know, I think during the time that you've been transitioning from uh, Amy Sang as a younger singer, as really as Susanna and as a, as a soubrette, and now as she's gotten a little bit older, her voice has taken on a, a more dramatic color to it, is that um, just be very at home with that, you know, and, and don't make it more than it is. Just stay, stay right here. And... Um, I felt like the beginning of it maybe was a little too slow because you got a long way to, to, to go in this. Um, what I liked about it especially was just the attention to text and detail. You know, she sort of describes exactly what she says, uh, and she's got Suzuki there, who is her servant, who knows very well that this just ain't going to happen. But, but she's a full participant in the in the, uh, in fact, Suzanne sung Suzuki probably so many times she still has the knee pads for it. You know? <laughs> but, uh, yeah, yeah. but uh, um, I, I think you got some time to, uh, to, to let this develop a little bit more. I think you can go move a little bit more quickly through the beginning of it. I'm just going to sit out and watch you a little bit. Do you mind doing it again? Okay. Start your ooh in a very beautiful and easy place. Can you find the rest of your vowels exactly there? You know, just don't don't amplify them backwards in any way.
Stay, stay very superficial with it. Okay. Don't, don't, don't allow it to, to. You're very good, Suzuki. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I forgot my pad. <laughs> I got nothing to say. <laughs> and so thank you so much, Amy, and thank you, Jesse, so much for being here. And we'll see you all at the concert tonight.